is to study the dark matter using things that we see. So the full definition of dark matter is something that we do not see. Uh, but we think it is there, <laughs> and if we uh, kind of had the dark matter goggles, we would see something that looks kind of like this. Uh, so you see a sky full of uh, big blobs, one towards the center of the Milky Way, one towards other galaxies like the Large Magellanic Cloud, and then there should be a lot of very, very small clumps uh, uh, that are kind of zooming around uh, all across the sky. And so the reason uh, why we think that is, uh, well, I'll hope to uh, share this with you in the next 15 minutes or so. So the basic uh, reason why we think there is dark matter, something that we don't see, is that we believe the physical laws, laws of nature that are, uh, that are valid here on Earth are valid everywhere in the universe. And so it's been uh, some centuries uh, since people measured uh, how fast the planets move um, around the sun. And they found that planets that are closer are moving faster. So you can see here the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, and Mars. Uh, and so you can see Mars is moving much more slower than, than Mercury. And this means that, well, we think we can explain this by forces of gravity that all of the mass in the solar system is contained within the sun or, 90, or more than 99% of the mass and the gravitational pull of the sun is strongest, uh, uh, the stronger the closer the object is. Uh, so we thought like, okay, this should kind of work everywhere else in the universe. And so when we, a few centuries later, were able to start uh, measuring velocities of stars uh, throughout the Milky Way galaxy, this is kind of what we expected. We expected those that are kind of close in to be moving faster than the ones that are farther out. However, what we actually measure is that the velocity is pretty much the same, regardless of where the star is uh, from the center of the galaxy. And this is actually work of another famous astronomer uh, uh, from Carnegie called Vera Rubin in the 70s. And so the, re the way to explain this would be that, well, there is some unseen matter that holds everything together and makes some of these very distant stars move uh, uh, pretty fast. And when people calculated how much matter there should be to hold everything together, it turned out that it needs to be uh, uh, 10 times more than what we see. So 90% of the mass is dark. And the big question in the last 100 years is, uh, what is this uh, dark matter? Our leading guess is that it is some kind of particle, but we cannot see it. We can only really feel it through gravitational interactions. And so there are very limited ways of studying kind of uh, or testing what this kind of new particle is. And one, well, a, a test that I like to do, uh, well, I'll describe it next. Uh, and <laughs> to kind of get a sense of why that works, uh, I have um, a, uh, jump start on the trivia and it's actually LA sports trivia so <laughs> hope I can get some uh, audience participation here so the first question is what is the oh fastball speed of Shuhei Ohtani 97 <laughs> uh oh there was a guess it is 97 miles per hour <laughs> okay what about LeBron James fast speed Thirty. Thirty. Nice. Twenty-three. Twenty-five. What was your guess? Fifteen. Any other? Ninety-seven. <laughs> okay. I think well, most of you guessed that it is lower than uh, the fastball speed, and that was correct. It is actually forty-five miles per hour, which is, uh, yeah, still pretty fast, although not as fast as the. Uh, 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 fastball speed. Uh, one reason that you probably guess why that is is that the basketball is much heavier <laughs> than the baseball, so it is uh, yeah, uh, harder to, to throw. But interestingly, if I were to calculate what is then the total energy of a uh, baseball and a basketball uh, that combines kind of the this kinetic energy of the motion and the potential energy of kind of how, how uh, far away it is from the you know from the ground. Uh, gets to the exact same number, it's 135 joules. So, so basically, uh, the reason why I wanted to start with this is to show that even if something uh, 
do objects have the same total energy? Uh, it is usually the case that the smaller object will be moving much faster. And this is the, the key lesson that will actually help us understand uh, different types of dark matter and how we can differentiate them uh, and, well, hopefully uh, in the few years be able to tell uh, uh, which one actually is the dark matter. So, smaller or less massive pa particles uh, move faster. Uh, I have another couple of examples here. <laughs> Turns out, uh, that a balloon filled with air can last much longer than the balloon filled with helium. And that's partly because the helium is a smaller molecule, can kind of uh, <laughs> escape faster. It also moves, moves faster, which helps it, again, escape all the balloon faster. And something similar is actually happening outside of the Earth uh, on the scales of our galaxy and the universe overall. Uh, and it relates to the dark matter. So we have two basic types of models of dark matter. One is in which uh, dark matter is a heavy particle called the cold dark matter. Uh, and another one is when the dark matter is a warm uh, dark matter uh, uh, made up of lighter, smaller particles. And these two images here are showing the results of computer simulations that took months and months uh, to calculate. Uh, kind of the evolution of the universe through the beginning of the time until today, and showing the density of dark matter around the galaxy like the Milky Way. So the Milky Way would be at the very center there, and then in a cold dark matter, it would be surrounded by so many, many clumps because those particles are heavy and they move slower and they can't really escape. So all of those small clumps persist for billions of years. In the warm dark matter case, we have lighter particles that are moving, zooming past, kind of, even if these small clumps form, they really uh, kind of dis get destroyed pretty fast because the particles, they can just kind of stream away. And so the result is that the galaxy like the Milky Way in this kind of universe would be pretty smooth. There would be some, some clumps over here, but not that many. And so this is the kind of experiment that I <laughs> uh, want to perform is to actually measure kind of what, what is the Milky Way like. And so just to set the scale, like now, now this is actually to scale. We have a galaxy like the Milky Way, has 100 billion uh, uh, solar masses of stars, and it's surrounded by a trillion solar masses of dark matter. And what we can tell at the moment is that there is like, there is dark matter, it's kind of uh, at least somehow smooth. And this kind of smooth distribution corresponds to a model that, if you wanted to guess, you probably could, uh, but I'll not make you. <laughs> it's called the hot dark matter. So th they ha this has no clumps at all. So it's like even warmer than warm, so it's hot. Uh, then another option is that it is warm, so it has some clumps, and then cold, it has many clumps. And so we've been on the lookout for these small clumps. Um, and when we were searching around kind of what is orbiting the Milky Way, we found, oh, there are some clumps of stars. And when we measure those, so those are the small satellite galaxies, like the Magellanic Cloud that we saw previously. And when we measured those small galaxies, we found they also have dark matter around them. So we know at least some of these uh, uh, clumps exist in the Milky Way halo. So it means that this model that predicts none, we can cross out. However, we don't know exactly how many <laughs> there are. So this question between the warm and the, uh, the cold dark matter is still open. And so the question is, how do we find them? Uh, they can go as slow as like Earth's uh, Earth mass. Uh, we think those that are less massive than a million solar masses are completely dark. So even if we discover every small galaxy around the Milky Way, we'll still not <laughs> know if all of these exist because we do think that they will be completely dark. And so that's a, that's a question. Uh, what we do know is that they interact gravitationally. And so we think they can actually pull on the stars that are orbiting the halo of the Milky Way. And so I have a movie here that basically is outlining my whole research. Whoa. Okay. So setting the stage, this is the Milky Way. There, most of the stars are in this disk. Uh, sun is somewhere right here. There are streams of stars. Stars are moving on similar orbits around the Milky Way. They're very regular. And when they encounter a clump of dark matter, actually some of the stars get kind of kicked out. And so these are the kinds of signatures that I'm trying to look for. 
these gaps in stellar streams. They serve kind of as a <laughs> kind of a who done it? Like something happened to this solar stream. There is a massive impact. As, as they serve sort of as a signature of a fast interaction within uh, between uh, a dark matter clump and these groups of stars. And so, <laughs> what we would like to know is, does this actually happen in the Milky Way? And what was maybe not as realistically portrayed in this particular visualization is the ratio of the stars in the Milky Way and the stellar stream. It's uh, like at least a million times smaller uh, in a stellar stream. So actually finding them is uh, not easy. <laughs> this idea ca uh, came about 25 years ago to use the stellar streams and look uh, for evidence of the, uh, them being hit by clumps of dark matter. It actually took us, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, basically 15 years to start uh, discovering these stellar streams in large numbers. Uh, but now we do have, uh, so this is a schematic view of the, the halo of, or the stellar halo of the Milky Way. The sun is here. I'm not showing all of the Milky Way, it's just the grid. Uh, all of the colored points are different uh, stellar streams. Uh, the one that you showed before is called GD1, it's over here, and it's one of the very special streams because it's one of the first ones that we have really been able to observe very well. And uh, But my collaborator and I uh, were really excited about, uh, I guess now seven years ago, in 2018, but it was new data from the Gaia Space Telescope. So this is a space telescope that really precisely measured positions of stars for bil two billion stars. And what we were able then to do is uh, filter stars uh, both uh, based on kind of where they are and how they are moving to search for st stars that are part of the stellar stream that are moving in the same direction. And so this is the map of that GD1 stellar stream when we only select stars that are farther away than, than the Earth uh, or farther than 3,000 light years. So this is pretty far. So we are really looking for stars that are far away. And you see pretty much nothing here, <laughs> a very smooth uh, distribution. So the, these two coordinates are just angles on the sky. Uh, and they are oriented in such a way that the stream should appear uh, right at the center. So OK, this was like, OK, we need to try harder. This is, but this is hard. <laughs> it's a hard problem. So that's why it took uh, basically uh, 15 years uh, since, the, uh, since that first idea came about. Uh, so what we tried next was actually select stars that are moving in the opposite direction of everything else. Yeah. And so call this a retrograde orbit. Maybe if you you know heard in astrology, retrograde might be a word that you've heard of. <laughs> it actually has an astronomical meaning, and we use it all the time in this uh, type of study because most of the stars in the Milky Way kind of move in the same direction, like the sun. But this particular stream goes in the opposite direction, which makes it really easy to pick out if you can measure the velocities of stars. So if you just kind of selected the stars and moving in the opposite direction, this is what you get. And you see there is kind of stream kind of popping in. So the, and by the way, these are like actual stars that we, we, uh, we saw. And then finally, we select, OK, we think that these objects are kind of old and metal poor, and we can select stars that are basically bluer than average stars around the Milky Way. And so now you're, seeing, yeah, now you're really seeing it. And might even say like, oh, it looks like you just, there's a stream and there's some constant uh, kind of scattering of stars that are just uh, stars in the Milky Way. So if you calculate the probability that one of the, uh, the stars is part of this background population versus part of the stream uh, and color code by this probability, you get something that looks like this. And so we were super excited when we saw it for the first time because there are these gaps exactly what, <laughs> like what we uh, expected to see if the stream was hit by dark matter. Uh, so we thought, OK, this might actually be the first evidence uh, of a dark matter, of a dark, dark matter clump in the Milky Way. We like, so this happened in 2018. It basically it took us a few days to get to this plot. And then we wrote a paper uh, in the next few days. And within a week, a week of the data becoming available, it was uh, publicly announced on the archive, which is a kind of preprint service uh, for astronomers. So, you know, that was like some time ago. And then the, que like the question we've been all asking is, is, was this really dark matter? And OK, so 
there are really two main ways of testing uh, and kind of confirming whether this is really dark matter. The first is uh, understanding that these kinds of impacts should be numerous. Like we saw, there's a lot of those small clumps, there are a lot of streams, they should all be, or not, or many of them should be hit. Uh, another way uh, of testing this is by actually measuring velocities. If we uh, plot what this uh, velocity as a function of position along the stream is after the impact, it would have this very specific signature uh, that looks like that. So those are the kind of two main ways that we want to test uh, whether this actually was a small clump of dark matter, which would, and if it was, it would actually mean that dark matter is cold, forms those small clumps. So what did we find in the, in the, the uh, last seven years? We were able to look at the number of uh, different stellar streams, uh, the neighbor, labor, uh, a label here, uh, and we are basically in, in every one that we were able to study in uh, a lot, a lot of detail where we are confident we are uh, measuring the structure of solar streams. We are finding some interesting features. Uh, can be kind of wider streams, asymmetric streams, again, broken streams, streams that have wiggles. Uh, and this is super exciting uh, because, and you know, we are able to do this for a handful of streams now. We are expecting to do that for all of the streams that we know of and many more that we'll discover in the, well, starting in July 4th of 2025, uh, Vera Rubin Observatory will be releasing new deep uh, imaging of large areas of the sky, which will be exactly the kind of data that we can test this on for more streams. So, okay, so this is looking promising at the moment. Uh, then what about the velocities? Uh, the issue is that uh, the signature is very, very small for these kind of low mass clumps. It's on the order of 100 meters per second. Our current precision in measuring velocities is uh, 10 times worse, uh, which means that uh, we need to build a new instrument. And this is something that we are now doing at Carnegie Observatory. So here is one of our telescopes, the Magellan Clay, uh, in uh, Chile Atacama Desert, uh, shown with a new instrument under construction called VIA-SPEC, which is part of the VIA project uh, that we hope to have first light in January 2027, and then shortly after, uh, hope to be able to give you an update on this. Thank you.